Tuan. It's 1.30. We will call to order the October 23rd, 2019 meeting of the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency Board of Directors. I ask everyone to please rise. Robert, would you lead us in the pledge? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Please follow along with me to the pledge of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chair West? Yes. Director Aranio? Here. Director Craven? Here. Director Borchard? Here. And also, the record should reflect that uh, alternates Andy Waters and Bert Perillo are out there. I don't see anybody else. All right, moving on then, agenda review. No, no changes. Thank you. Okay, public, this public comments. This is an opportunity for a public to address the board on matters not otherwise on today's agenda. Anyone wishing to address the board, please come forward, identify yourselves, and do so now. Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on to, I'm sorry, there is one. Could it? Good afternoon. My name is Joan Lopez. Several months ago, the Board of Supervisors passed a moratorium on steam injection oil and gas wells, citing incomplete data as a justification for such action. Since the GMA has a duty to carry out programs, measures, or actions taken to preserve, protect, and enhance groundwater resources of the Fox Canyon Aquifer. I would hope this agency would do everything in their power to assure the people that the water is safe. And if contamination is an issue, then I'd encourage this agency to take the necessary steps for a remedy from a technical, scientific approach rather than the political perspective the board is leaning on. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bruce Hawley. I've been in uh, Ventura County for about 20 years. Um, just brief notes here. A, a moratorium on, on the oil and gas production in the Vo Fox Canyon area has been in place since April 23rd of this year due to concern over the presence of potentially naturally occurring gases in an area entirely within the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency jurisdiction. Propon proponents of this moratorium claim there is an apparent threat to public health and welfare. If this is truly the case, then why hasn't the Fox Canyon GMA board addressed the issue? In the five months since that first emergency vote, nothing more has been done to find out beyond a reasonable doubt if our water is in fact safe. I believe there was a if I believe that there is a true, was a true threat, true threat to public health, then this agency would be acting in this manner. I represent three car dealerships. We employ over 168 people. I can assure you, I and all of us at the dealerships value transparency. We work hard to earn the public trust every day particularly in regards to safety, and I would hope that the local government would follow this example. I have thousands of people depending on us at the store, at the stores to maintain their safety by keeping their vehicles safe. I do not believe that we should let the Board of Supervisors perpetuate fear, and I would ask you to work to assure the public that the water in Fox Canyon, Aquifier is safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my, board, my name is Trevor Zierhut. I live in Oxnard. On April 23rd of this year, the Ventura County Board of Supervisors passed an ordinance restricting certain oil and gas activities in an area entirely within Fox Canyon GMA jurisdiction. Proponents of the moratorium claim that there is an apparent threat to public health 
safety, and welfare associated with the Fox Canyon groundwater. They say that there is contamination from oil and gas extraction in the affected area. If this is truly the case, why hasn't Fox Canyon GMA board addressed the issue? If this really is an issue that we should be caring about, uh, I'd like to see this agency make a statement so that they publicly show uh, you know, definitively that the water supply is safe. Uh, the public deserves as much. And um, contrary to what has been said in the past here, uh, you know, Fox Canyon GMA's uh, uh, role is not just to um, uh, uh, oversee usage of water. The protection of the, uh, the, the water resources is also your charge as uh, was laid out in the law that created uh, Fox Canyon GMA. So I would hope that uh, you do your, uh, your responsibility uh, to, to put the pressure on the Ventura County Board of Supervisors uh, to show that the water is safe, if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We're moving on to board member comments. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I got an announcement to make that's going to be a, a little bit difficult for me to say. There's been a continuing and building drumbeat uh, surrounding me in regards to potential conflict of interest that have become a distraction. And it is my decision at this time to announce that this will be my final meeting on the Fox Canyon GMA board and that I am resigning and stepping down so that no longer will be a distraction. Mike Mobley will be taking over for you as United's representative, effective the end of this meeting. And um, for those individuals that came up and visited and talked to me about the uh, ordinances, allocations, and all the issues with the GMA over the past three years that have been on here, thank you. I learned a lot, and I really appreciated that you uh, put your trust in me in order to listen and work with you. It's been a great honor, and I'm going to miss it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Steve? Um, thank you, and thank you for your service. Uh, appreciate it. Um, at the last meeting that we had here, I put up uh, some uh, video that showed uh, 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 Director Borchard making some comments and uh, um, the Executive Director of United's response. Um, I, not everybody, some people that talked to me about couldn't quite hear all of that, et cetera. Uh, I just want to, uh, and, and subsequent to that, there was uh, further response about that. So I've got, I just have one slide. I'd like to put that slide up, please. Uh, this is this is what was said. The exact quote from Director Borchard was, take our grant money and buy more. And Mr. Gordato said, that's correct. And we've had lots of explanations about, no, it was a misunderstanding, and no, we uh, we just meant we had to release the water by June, June 1st. But I just want to go on record here that there is no way you can interpret this any other way except Yes, we were going to give them $3 million, and they were going to buy more state water. And then after that, they said, no, they're not going to buy more state water. They are now out there trying to buy some. But what was presented to us was not factually accurate and was intentionally misleading. Um, and you can't change those words. You can't say, oh, we were talking about a June 1st deadline. Um, uh, and we haven't even, you know, I can't even get the information as to whether the state actually did make more water available. Did they make more water available to United? And United said no, they didn't want to buy it at that time. And now they're out there trying to buy Casitas' allocation, et cetera. Um, it, it, it's created a, a really unfortunate mess, but you can't interpret that language any differently uh, than that. And I just wanted to go on record for that. So thank you for the time to do that. Appreciate it. Director Borchard, Director Craven, any other board member comments? Yeah, All right, let's move on then to the consent agenda. There are only two items on there. Unless someone wants, has questions or wants to pull an item off of the agenda, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move the approval. All, uh, second. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed. Okay, let's go on to item number three. Good afternoon, Chair West, members of the board. For the record, I'm Kim Loeb, Fox Canyon staff. This is a periodic review of Emergency Ordinance E. And uh, it's buzzing for some reason. Um, I'll start out with a brief background. Um, as you all know, the ordinance was adopted in April 2014 in response to the ongoing drought and, and uh, groundwater conditions. The goal was to reduce extractions by 20% relative to um, a prior 10-year period, 2003 to 2012. The ordinance also suspended the uh, accrual and use of conservation credits and prohibited new wells that would uh, result in increase in extractions. Our municipal and industrial operators were placed on the temporary extraction allocation, or T, which was a fixed allocation based on the annual, uh, average annual extractions over that 10 year period, 2003 to 2012, and that was then reduced by 20%. Our ag operators were placed on the annual efficiency allocation, which was a uh, variable allocation based on efficiency and implemented the irrigation allowance index. And there was a 25% reduction on the index values that had previously been in use um, at that about maybe 30 or, or percent of the ag operators had been using prior to ordinance E. Your boards receive periodic updates on ordinancy, on the implementation, the effectiveness, and potential uh, modifications over since it was adopted. Uh, certainly the drought conditions lasted much longer than anyone expected, and so did the ordinance uh, life as well. Your board considered potential modifications to the IAI in uh, June 2018, but we've been, your board's been considering um, various new allocation systems and the determination at that time was let's focus on the new allocation ordinances that are going to replace the ordinance E allocations and, and leave ordinance E alone at this time. So, the conditions that we have now is, is drought conditions have continued since the uh, implementation of the ordinance. Uh, other than slightly above average rainfall in 2017, the years since 2014 have continued to be below average rainfall. Average Santa Clara River diversions are at record lows. Um, Prior to this year, they were averaging about 4,800 acre feet a year in, in the years um, following Ordinance E. And historically, since the Freeman diversion was installed, they were about 61,000 acre feet a year. This year, there have been a, about 38,000 acre feet diverted, still well less than. Um, what has historically been diverted, including the 15,000 that were uh, part of the FCGMA sponsored uh, diversion. These are the uh, potentiometric surface maps of the upper and lower aquifer systems that give an overall basin wide or GMA wide view of where the water levels are on average. This is the fall 2014 upper aquifer system. Um, and uh, when Ordinance E was adopted, and this is the fall 2018 upper aquifer system. And I'll switch back and forth and you can see the darker colors, the red, redder colors, of course, are deeper uh, water levels or potentiometric surface. And uh, uh, you can see that we're still 
In fact, much of the uh, Oxnard plain is at a, a lower depth and there still um, is not significant improvement. In terms of the lower aquifer system, this is the 2014 map. And uh, here's the 2018 map. I'll switch back and forth. And you can see that, uh, in fact, 2018 was looking like the um, water levels were, in fact, deeper overall. Taking a look at the average uh, extractions in the basins, and this is the first year that we have um, moved to looking at the basins based on the DWR Bolton 118 basin definition that Sigma has uh, uh, caused us to move forward with the, and the GSPs will be managed by part of that where we used a slightly different um, basin designations and boundaries that were identified in our 2007 groundwater management plan. Um, and this uh, reporting here is in uh, crop year periods, the baseline period 2003 to 2012 in the uh, first column here. And this is total pumping. And we just used a simple color scheme comparing um, if uh, the extractions increase since the 24, or the, since the baseline period extractions, we marked them in red. Um, if they decreased between uh, zero and uh, 20%, we showed them in yellow. And then if they were 20% or more, which was the goal of ordinancy, we showed them in green. And so overall, you can see that um, uh, in the four reporting periods since, or four years since Ordinance E was adopted through 18-1, we're still getting the 19-2 um, uh, which would be, uh, or I'm sorry, 19-1 which would be the current reporting or most recent reporting period that data are not complete yet, so we did not include them in the analysis. But you can see that um, overall uh, the pumping has uh, been uh, greater than the ordinancy uh, baseline period, except for in the 2016-17 uh, year. And I will note that was the year that we got um, good rainfall. The rest of the years uh, we did not. Looking at m &I extractions, um, overall, the uh, extractions were less, or met the 20% goal, or in fact, achieved greater than the 20% reduction goal. In Las Postas Valley, I should note that these are based on 20% uh, reduction from the average pumping of 2003 through 2012. There were a significant number of variances issued due to uh, receipt of in lieu water and other reasons um, after implementation of ordinancy. And so that is why the uh, Las Postas Valley MI pumping looks low. It, I mean, doesn't look like it's met its target. It has been meeting its allocation targets, which were modified by variance. But, um, if we look at Oxnard and Pleasant Valley, uh, we see that uh, both in both those basins, the m &I operators are, have been uh, doing a good job of meeting those requirements. And again, the T allocation reduction is a fixed allocation, and uh, um, it was not flexible. They, they had to meet those or uh, receive surcharge. Looking at the agricultural extractions versus ordinancy baseline. In the staff report, we have each of these periods uh, broke the four subsequent years broken out. Um, I've put the average of those four years up here on this chart. And so we've also include surface water because uh, uh, we know how important uh, surface water and conjunctive use is, and it's part of the whole picture, but ordinancy was an extraction allocation um, 
ordinance. And so that's what we look at the extractions and compare them to. So in the baseline period, um, the total extractions, average extractions for ag was about 82,000 acre feet a year for uh, the entire uh, GMA jurisdiction. And the average subsequently has been about 102,000. If we look at the individual um, basins, we see kind of a variable picture here. We see in the Royal Santa Rosa Basin, which there aren't that many operators, there's just uh, uh, a few uh, agricultural operators in the GMA portion of the Royal Santa Rosa Basin. And uh, overall, those extractions reduced about 16%. In Las Posas Valley, where we don't have the uh, Santa Clara River water or uh, significant conjunctive use, we see the pumping increased about um, uh, 15% over time. Um, and in Oxnard and Pleasant Valley, we see that in Oxnard, we see that the extractions increased about 25% on average, but the total water use, including the um, Santa Clara River water deliveries, were down about 5%. Um, and Pleasant Valley, a similar uh, story, 58% increase in extractions, but about 7% reduction overall water use. Across all of ag, it's about a wash, the pumping, um, or the total water use um, is just about the same as what it was in the baseline period. But again, um, we're looking at uh, extractions in Ordinance E, and, but this gives us the whole picture of uh, water use. So we can draw some conclusions from our uh, experience so far in analysis of Ordinance E. And those are that the variable annual efficiency allocation using IEI has been ineffective in achieving the Ordinance E uh, goal of 20% reduction by, for ag extractions. As we talked about, those ag extractions increased by about 25% on average. However, the total water use has remained about the same. Um, I won't go through the individual uh, basins. I just talked to them at, on the table. Looking at the MNI side, uh, the fixed allocation imposed on MNI operators by Ordinance E and the 20% uh, reduction on that was successful in achieving the 20% reduction. And the total MNI reductions have been, uh, or extractions have been increased by about 21% in the four years following Ordinance E. Based on those findings and with the uh, allocation ordinance uh, consideration for Oxnard Pleasant Valley, that's the next item on your agenda, we have some recommendations for your board's consideration. Uh, this is receive and file and direct, so there's no uh, specific uh, action other than to uh, direct us on this. And so number one, uh, we recommend moving forward with adoption of the new OPV extraction allocation ordinance with an effective date of October 1st, 2020. And we'll talk more about that on, when we review the ordinance next, uh, next item, why we're recommending that date. Uh, we would uh, recommend completing development and adoption of a new extraction allocation ordinance for the Las Posas Valley, effective the same date. We, that effort has been on hiatus um, due to a number of reasons, as, and especially as we've concentrated on the OPV ordinance. Um, we have not, your board has not considered a new extraction allocation ordinance for the Rosa Santa Rosa Valley Basin. We'd recommend that um, your board consider uh, a new extraction allocation ordinance there so we can move off Ordinance E um, allocations through all the basins effective October 1st, 2020. We're recommending to keep the Ordinance E allocation provisions in effect until those new um, 
till we transition to those new allocation uh, ordinances. Um, and we're further we're modify, we're recommending your board consider modifying ordinance C to rescind the 20% reduction of T allocation for the M and I operators in the coming year till we move to the new allocation ordinance. Um, in the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley, where, where the majority of uh, M and I pumping is occurring, um, that's fairly similar to what their new allocation would be under the ordinance your board's considering. And uh, uh, it will uh, it'll go some ways to recognizing the M and I uh, folks' uh, concerns that well, um, ag has under the, the ordinance EAC has been able to flex its pumping to make up for the loss of water, uh, surface water. They have not been able to and uh, have uh, um, felt uh, concern about that. So that is, uh, those are staff's recommendations. That's the end of my presentation. And I welcome any questions that you have at this time. Questions from the board at this time? Let me open it up to the public. Then, any questions from the public with respect to the review of Ordinance E? Questions, comments? No name calling? Hi, good afternoon, Chairman West and members of the board. My name is Alden Broom, um, a grower on the Oxnard Plain. Uh, so, I, I appreciate the analysis that Kim did. Um, and I think it is fair to say that, that ag extraction was higher in emergency ordinance E compared to the base period that they focused on, the 2003 to 2012 period. I'd just like to add some context. Um, you know, I think it's critical that we focus on the integrated water supplies in our basin. You, you saw surface water included in the charts and how these supplies alternate with one another during wet and dry periods you know, in essence, the conjunctive use that's present in our basin. You know, for context, the 2003 and to 12 period was a definably wet period. It received 50% more precipitation than the, the Ordinance E period. Um, you know, using an Oxnard Airport weather station, there was about 14 inches of rain in that T period and about nine inches of rain in the 2014 to 18 period. So uh, it was a drought. And you'd have to go all the way back to 87 to 91 to find a comparable drought. During that time, ag's total water use was 95,000 acre feet per year in the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. In the current five year period, it was closer to 70,000 applied water. We lost some acres to conversion, but uh, we, we've, we're doing a, a better job compared to a similar drought. The conjunctive use projects that I think are, are highlighted in the table, mainly Caneo Creek projects and Eclair River, in the TEA period, it was 22,000 acre feet a year on average. That shrunk to 3,000 acre feet per year. And I think as your draft ordinance correct, uh, correctly states, that surface water was used in lieu of pumping groundwater and provided great benefit to the basin. So to focus on the increase of, in extractions, it's correct math. But, it, but it, I think we need to appreciate what the conjunctive use projects represented in that base period or those period of 10 years that you focus on. So, and why, you know, so in ag, we've, we tend to look at applied water. And why is that important? Because 50% of the irrigated lands in the Oxnard Plain and Pleasant Valley Basin has access to conjunctive use systems, mainly the PTP and the PV system. You know, when you're a user of water in one of those systems, you can't discern whether you're conserving groundwater, surface water, recycled water. You conserve water. It's what comes out of the turnout. So, um, so to that end, I think if you look at the applied water conservation during the, the emergency ordinance C, you've seen year-over-year -year reductions in ag in the Oxnard Plain and Pleasant Valley basins. This was evident in the charts presented by your staff in your January 2019 board meeting where you saw a step down in applied water use. So I think um, in the most recent data, 2018, appears to be the lowest applied water use in the history of the GMA for the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. It's 4,000 acre feet lower 
than 2005, which when almost 24 inches of rain fell in the Oxnard Plain. There were a little over eight inches of rain that fell in the Oxnard Plain during calendar year 2018. So, you know, I compliment the MI community. I think they achieved their 20% reduction in extractions. But I believe agriculture is doing its part. It takes, it takes time. I recall Lynn Mulhart's analogy of two trains leaving the station. So finally, I think you should consider this comparison as a wet period with ample conjunctive use to a dry period or a drought with minimal or in lieu water available to ag. And I think it highlights the importance for managing applied water under an allocation system that can, considers variable weather patterns and surface water availability. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions from the board? Move staff's recommended actions. A second. Before that, I've got a couple of questions. Can we go back to the recommended action? Oh. AV booth. There they go. It's locked up for me. Oh, well, it's coming. The I think the last item on there was the sort of a give back to M and I. Um, there we are. The lab board consider potential modifications to II. Oh, maybe not. Wrong slide. Sorry. Yeah. Here we go. We'll keep going. It was the last one you had up there. There we go. There you go. Okay. Uh, modify ordinance to rescind the twenty percent reduction. I guess I have a couple of questions. Number one, why? If if the if the rationale is um, that. M and I reduced and AG didn't. Um, I think that's that's a failed analysis. It's true where extractions are concerned, and if ordinance C only looks at extractions, that's a fair conclusion. But with respect to the health of the basin and policy making, I don't think that's the correct starting point, because the the same data when you look at what Alden was referring to, total applied water, you see a 20% reduction between the base period and 2018. It took ag longer to get its reductions in place, but when you look at the combination of extractions and surface water use, you start seeing reductions below the base period in 2014 and every year thereafter. The point being that today, when we look at the 2018 total applied water, we see more than a 20% reduction in 2018 versus the base period. So if the, if the modification is being proposed to Ordinance C on the basis that GM and I complied and AG didn't, I think that's, a, that's the wrong place to start. And my second question, I guess, as part of the why is, from a sustainability standpoint, isn't that going in the wrong direction? So we, the give back is what I'm talking about. Uh, so Chair West, yes, I'll address that question. But first, uh, um, I would like a, a clarification. Did I hear you just say that um, your understanding is that the total ag use, water use, was 20% less than what the ordinance? Yeah, the numbers that I'm looking at show total. Tell us the page. No, it's show a, um, do, you have, do you have, I don't know if you have this one up, but round numbers instead of adding all these things. During the base period, we were looking at applied water of about 75,000 acre feet. And that's 54,460 um, extracted, 9,800 plus um, Santa Clara River deliveries, PTP deliveries of 5,700, Canal Creek deliveries of 4,900. And that's in the, on average, during the 2005-2014 base period. Fast forward to 2018, there's 55,000 plus of extractions and about 6,000 in surface water deliveries. The aggregate being about 62,000. And the delta between 62,000 and 75,000 is over 20%. So, uh, yeah, that's what I was 
and I sent you these. I, I think you've got these. You've seen those. Right. I think, yeah, yeah. and that's uh, looking at Oxnard and Pleasant Valley itself. Right. Overall, across season. all the basins, it's about a wash. And during the average of the four years, um, it was a reduction of about 5% in Oxnard and about 7% in Pleasant Valley. So notwithstanding that, the reason, for the one of the principal reasons for our recommendation uh, to relax the 20% restriction or reduction on m and is that um, they have had this concern about this for a long time. We've been in protracted uh, stakeholder discussions for quite a few uh, years over allocation development. Um, we we and, uh, and the M&I folks thought that we were going to have an allocation ordinance starting at the beginning of this of 2019 and then we've been working with the understanding much of this year that would be effective in October and then maybe uh, the beginning of the year. For a number of reasons we're recommending that it makes the most sense to um, push that off to for the um, effective date of next October as we've talked about with your executive committee and much of the um, discussion and hangs have been with the ordinance have been um, around the Santa Clara River water flex allocation. Your, your board was ready to adopt the ordinance, it seemed, in June until there were some concerns with that and we worked to refine that. Um, and, uh, and so moving to, for Oxnard and Pleasant Valley anyway, um, moving to that ordinance would have provided the M&I folks with a similar base period and a similar allocation of the unreduced T. Now that we're pushing back um, to October, that's, that's one of the principal reasons that we are uh, recommending that because they have had this restriction, they've met that restriction, and, uh, and now we're asking them to continue on for another year uh, to, until we implement the new ordinance. Yes, it will increase extractions in the basin. There's no doubt about that. And it will make for us a little bit steeper slope of where we have to get to at the end of the day. Um, and uh, I think that your board's argued uh, in the past that that's where uh, what's been happening with Ordinance E on the agricultural side as well. So I, I think there, that argument can be made. It's certainly true um, uh, it, that relaxing, allowing more extraction will increase extractions in the uh, basins. So um, I think that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless we're certain that we've got an ordinance locked in, ready to go, and we know that we're moving, and it's just going to be a, for a fixed time until we get to where we uh, need to be in this transitional time. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure it helps, but it makes sense is the, the point. I mean, I, I, my concern is with the increased extraction as opposed sure. to, you know, I mean, yes, it makes sense as an explanation, but I'm not sure that it gets us closer to being sustainable is the point I was making. Mr. Chairman, we have a motion and a second on floor. I imagine this is our discussion period. Would the other uh, members that made the motion be willing to break the five items out and vote on them individually? I, I, I think we can always do that if this motion fails, but I think it makes sense. This is a coordinated, this is a coordinated series of policies, and so I think it makes sense for us to, to vote on them. I do want to speak to uh, to the issue. Uh, I appreciate your recognition that this is extra extractions. Uh, when it's extra extractions for M and I, we seem to be pretty firm. We gave them. We didn't give them an IAI exemption or any any you know other kinds of exemptions. We just said twenty percent, and they had to do that. And for a number of years, they have done that. Uh, they have been expecting uh, that would end, and we have we have continued to postpone. But uh, we all recognized that IAI was not working for reducing extractions from ag, and we were perfectly fine knowing that was more than what, that was increasing extractions. We, we, so I don't, I, I think that there, there, there are many things we have to consider. 
One of them is, you know, the impact on the base, and the other one is the sense of fairness uh, in terms of implementation of our policies. And I think it's uh, completely unfair to keep saying M and I has to do this when the ag extractions did not meet anywhere near our expectations. And a lot of people will say that the IAI was easily manipulated uh, so that people could could uh, could could uh, extract more than they, they would have had we had come up with some other system uh, in terms of doing that. So uh, I, I think it's in, at some point in time, that has to be one of the other factors that you consider um, that uh, if this is going to be the allocation that M and I is probably going to start with next October, it's fair that we start there at this point in time. That's my rationale for it. Whether that's uh, what the other board members think or what the three of us think, uh, but I think you'll I think you'll find some significant issues if this board uh, continues to to put hold M and I to a different standard. Okay. I agree with Supervisor Bennett. When we adopted uh, Emergency Ordinance E, it was to reduce pumping. It wasn't looking at overall water uh, use. It, uh, it was to reduce pumping, uh, and that hasn't ha that did uh, M and I did reduce, and Ag didn't. I mean, that's the way this chart looks to me. Uh, that's the way it was explained to us, and I haven't heard any other. When you look at total water usage. Uh, M and I also got water from other sources, and M and I encouraged all of its, uh, well, at least the municipalities, uh, encouraged all of their residents and did everything they could to get their residents to change as much as they could. They changed toilets, they changed shower heads, they changed. Uh, Landscaping, these are all permanent things that will use less and less water as time goes on. Uh, I don't know, except for the claim at my council meeting two weeks ago, and I expect the same claims tonight, that uh, industrial hemp uses a lot more water, so everybody should switch to that. I haven't seen a lot of change in crops to try to reduce water use. It's how are we going to get more water to use what we have been using. So I think it, it is justifiable. The uh, ag, uh, I mean, the M&I people have reduced, and I think that it is uh, equitable to keep number five, the recommendation number five. I think that we should kind of correct a little bit the concept that Ordinance E was an extraction ordinance. Um, its goal may have been to decrease extractions, but it was an efficiency ordinance. And the other part of it was to uh, put a moratorium on wells. And the efficiency part of the equation was about total water. That's why on the reporting, you report all your water sources, and that's how you come up with your efficiency number. So um, it's kind of not an apples to apples comparison to, to say that extractions perhaps didn't meet the mark in certain uh, time periods is a, a pretty easy conclusion to make and, and not, un, not untrue. But um, the concept with, with emergency ordinance E was that we were going to base ag water use on scientifically founded, efficient use. And then if we found that, that uh, those numbers were not adequate, we were going to reduce them uh, on an equal percentage base across all crops. By doing so, we, we thought that we, we would probably equitably distribute that reduction among all the different crop values. Um, for some various reasons that maybe wasn't the best approach, but I still hold that it wasn't a failure in terms of a policy. I think it took us a, a, a great deal down the road towards encouraging a lot of conservation, and we see that in the total applied water number. Um, so uh, 
important to realize those distinctions. Um, whether uh, M and I should be given some ability to pump for an additional year, uh, okay, I guess. We're all going to ramp down again anyway, and so if the ramp down is steeper, okay. But um, uh, in, in defense of a policy, I thought, and I still do, that it was a, a pretty good attempt at trying to do a, a, a better job of what we called efficiency in the past. And, um, and I think it did do a lot of good in terms of reducing overall water consumption in the ag sector. Any other questions or comments yeah, before we? I do. <clears throat> Thank you, all your comments. Um, so, whereabouts am I on this issue? It would be really, really easy for me to jump at this one and go ahead and accept staff's recommendations as presented. What the hell is my last meeting? I'm M and I. Boy, that just is all right there for the picking. But I'm against it. I'm against it. The map that you put up there, comparing 2018 water levels versus 2014 shows a dramatic difference in what's going on out there. And I'm seeing it in my wells. I've been barking about it out there in Las Postas Valley about what's going on with my wells that I'm seeing over there. And as much as we have this argument going back and forth about M and I made the cut and agged in and all that, that's, that's, that's just noise. That's noise. We shouldn't be listening to it. Our mission statement is to bring the basins into balance and stop seawater intrusion. Cut and dry, that's it. Applied water, surface water, here, not there, whatever. That is just noise in the equation for me. Given M and I back their 20% and allowing that water to be extracted when those levels are and the water's not coming off the river into the spreading basins is just a step in the wrong direction. It doesn't get us closer to sustainable yield. It doesn't. It may lessen some of the pain for a couple months in the M and I, but it's not the answer, and it's not the right direction, and it certainly isn't within what the scope, mission statement, and responsibility is for this board. So that's why I'm willing to offer we go ahead and break these out, but otherwise, I can't go with it. I'll make my final comments. I, I, I think if our sole measurement was that standard uh, that you just identified. There are all kinds of decisions that we would not have made over the last four years. Decisions to postpone and kick down the road and take longer and to continue with IAI when we knew it wasn't working. Uh, and we didn't apply that standard until now. Only now when there is a request to restore some small level of equity to M&I after four years of cutting. That's the problem. It's the inconsistency of the application of the standard. Um, it's easy to hold that standard up, and uh, quite frankly, when I tried to hold that standard up on the issues of not kicking the can down the road, that standard was soundly rejected over and over again here. No, there are other reasons. No, it's going to be too hard. No, it's no, and, and in fact, the unfair application of the standard was one of the reasons identified for um, for not going forward with something other than IAI. Uh, so now we now we now when it applies to M and I, we're we're very clear on the standard. Other times we aren't. That's inconsistency. I don't think is healthy for good government um, to to have that out there. Thank you very much. I stand by the motion. We have. We have a motion and a second. Leader roll call. Chair West? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Aranio? No. Director Cravens? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. Okay. Moving on then to. Chair, if I, if I may, may make one clarification, I should make. So your direction us is to come back to you with a revised ordinance revision implementing that. That was a yes vote for all five of your recommendations. Yes. So I see. Moving on to item number four, then. Mm -hmm. 
Chair West, members of the board, this item is um, the proposed ordinance to establish a new pumping allocation system for the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. This has been a long road that we have been on. Um, and in light of the length of time that you and stakeholders and staff and everyone uh, has been working on this effort, and the uh, 11th hour letters that came in, um, it, it probably makes sense to take some time to step back and uh, just kind of review how we got to where we are today. So back in October of 2015, your board directed that there needed to be a new OPV allocation system, or new allocation system developed for the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. And the stated preference was that uh, that the stakeholders work to develop something and bring a proposal to the agency and the board. Um, in January of 2017, your board expressed its concern that there did not seem to be much progress being made. There wasn't much being brought to your board to consider um, and directed staff to develop an interim plan in the case that a stakeholder developed plan was not uh, proffered forward and, and uh, um, acceptable to your board. Staff worked for uh, the next year with a meeting with stakeholder group representatives, lots and lots of meetings to help develop the, uh, the interim allocation plan, which could have become a, uh, a permanent allocation plan if that it would the direction that it went. Um, in November and of 2017 and then January of 2018. Staff presented that plan to your board. And then in March of 2018, uh, the OPV Ag Stakeholder Group um, brought forward a white paper that they had uh, developed uh, with a proposal for an allocation system. Much of what was in that white paper in the proposed system was similar to what had been worked on with the stakeholders for the interim system, but some key differences were a base period and the land-based allocation idea. Um, and this isn't every board meeting. These are just some of the more the highlights, if you will. Um, in July of 2018, your board spent all day on allocation, had a workshop in the morning, and then a regular meeting in the afternoon uh, at the workshop. Uh, there were presentations from a variety of stakeholders on uh, various parts of the allocation, including from the OPV Ag Group and other stakeholders. At the August 18 meeting, your board directed that we should move forward with the allocation system with wellhead-based um, allocations for an interim period with a transition to land-based system at a later date when it's feasible. Uh, and then later that year, September and October, your board provide additional direction on development of that ordinance. October 24th of 2018 was the first reading of the draft ordinance. And at that meeting, that's when your board directed that we use the 2005-2014 base period for all the wells. We had lots of discussions about a variety of base periods um, all through the, the summer. And we came back on the 20th with the first reading of the revised ordinance that included that base period for all wells. Um, and um, that also included the idea of the Santa Clara River flex allocation, much in the very similar to the way it looks like now. It's been refined a little bit. Um, your board uh, directed that then the issue of the Canal Creek water came up. Your board directed we go back and look at adjusting Pleasant Valley's allocation based on that Canal Creek usage. And we came back in January of 2019, and that's when we talked about using 85% of the adjusted historical allocation. Uh, your board said, go meet with Pleasant Valley and others um, and uh, resolve six specific uh, topics. Um, well, actually, I think that was direction from the February 19th, the following meeting. And 
That was to uh, resolve the differences with the uh, Canal Creek project water, include language addressing emergency situations, revise the language regarding the Santa Clara water flex allocation, principally nomenclature. There was confusion about um, how it was, what it was called, address concerns about carryover at commonly owned facilities. Um, that was when the uh, OH contractor issue came up and your board said if uh, OH pipeline contractors and United can develop mutually agreeable language, we'll put it in the ordinance and then address the carryover of unused Santa Clara River allocation. We updated your board on the progress and said that we had resolved most of those issues at that meeting. Um, uh, that's when your board uh, ag agreed that Pleasant Valley's uh, allocation for the Canal Creek water should be 49.78 with some provisions to reduce their allocation based on every acre foot they receive and provision for um, other pumpers in the Pleasant Valley service area to uh, um, petition your board for some of that allocation if they can make a showing. So June was the last meeting that your board heard this. We came back with ready to adopt an ordinance. Uh, your board, uh, based on comments, seemed ready to adopt the ordinance, but there were some stakeholder comments, principally from uh, United, re regarding some concerns about how the Santa Clara River flex allocation would work during periods of extreme dry years and periods of extreme years. Uh, there was a request for a, a minor change to the wording regarding uh, consideration of allocation adjustment due to the declared emergency. And your board directed that staff work with the executive committee to develop recommendations for addressing variance requests from pumpers with less than full 10-year reporting period, which staff had reported to your board that there seemed to be a significant number, at least in the uh, ag pumpers. So that brings us to today. Um, staff met, uh, had, had multiple meetings with stakeholders, including United and Pleasant Valley and the OPV uh, m &I group regarding principally the Santa Clara uh, River water flex allocation. Uh, we did, uh, your, your executive committee met on, in July and then uh, on the first of this month. Um, and. Uh, we talked about the flex rules with your uh, committee, and we have made a number of changes based on comments from Pleasant Valley and United, several uh, iterations which we'll talk about as we go through the ordinance, um, and uh, so that the rules were revised in, in response to their comments. In order to try and give everybody plenty of time to um, comment on the ordinance. We, we circulated a working draft of the ordinance to um, uh, representatives of, of various stakeholder groups that we that had been involved uh, with this development over time. And we received uh, quite a lot of comments that were helpful and we, we worked and made some changes to the, um, the working uh, draft of that ordinance. In fact, some of the comments that were just received are really um, we have those, some of those things have already been addressed in the, uh, the version that's here before you now. So that's, that's where we are today. And now I'll go through um, the, uh, the ordinance. I think I'll, go, I'll look to your board for your uh, board's direction, how much detail you want me to get in on each of these sections. Much of it you have seen quite a few times. Um, you know, in the general provi provisions, uh, the new ordinance replaces the emergency ordinance uh, E and agency ordinance code allocations. They're assigned to extraction facilities with the intent to transition to a land-based system in the future. Comp codes continue with the ability for extractors to combine facilities in a basin. There is a... a caveat in the ordinance that your board can, in the future, by resolution, uh, consider limiting comp codes based on management areas identified in the GSPs 
um, with a finding. And uh, the language that is included that was developed jointly by United and the uh, OH contractors. Excuse me, Kim, is the red line version that we have in the packet the latest version of the? Yes. Yes, that is the version. The red line and the final version are the versions that are under consideration today. Um, there's a provision in here uh, regarding a declaration of an emergency and, and uh, your board's consideration of uh, allocation adjustment request in response to that emergency. We removed the word regularly scheduled me. We removed the word regularly um, at the request of your board at the last meeting, uh, well, January, June meeting, last meeting we discussed this here. And uh, there's provision that your board will periodically review the uh, effectiveness of the ordinance toward meeting the GSP sustainability goals at least once every five years uh, to kind of sync up with that, but certainly can do it more often. Uh, initial allocations are assigned to each extraction facility based on the annual average extractions between 2005 to 2014, excluding any extractions that incurred surcharges. Um, as we talked about a moment ago, Pleasant Valley's initial extraction allocation was increased due to the Canal Creek project water. Uh, deliveries and their reduce, reduction of pumping within their service area provided Pleasant Valley reduces uh, their extraction by an acre foot on a one-to-one -one basis each year that they receive Canal Creek water. And uh, this is that provision I mentioned a moment ago about the board may transfer a portion of the additional allocation to an operator of Pleasant Valley <coughs> County service area upon a finding or a showing that it reduced pumping during the basis as a result of taking increased deliveries from Pleasant Valley. The Santa Clara River flex water allocation. Again, this is a flexibility. It's not an extraction allocation. An increase in extraction allocation over the long term, um, it's essentially a borrowing and when uh, to facilitate conjunctive use and recognize the uh, significant part that, that Santa Clara River water pipeline deliveries play for United and uh, uh, United's PT pumping trough pipeline and Pleasant Valley County's uh, serve, uh, deliveries as well. And so the flex allows um, annual extractions, an increase in annual extractions by United or Pleasant Valley in years when deliveries to the pumping trough pipeline and PV pipeline systems are below that 2005 to 2014 average, providing that correspondingly there's a reduction in extractions in the years that the um, Santa Clara River water delivery systems are greater than that baseline period. One of the things that was a concern, really the principal thing that was a concern at the June meeting um, was that uh, There, in late season, there's late season demand on both these systems for agricultural irrigation. And even though uh, it might be a really big water year and there might be a lot of deliveries on a Santa Clara system, these, there's, they're not storable and there's not the, other than by um, recharging them into the ground. Um, and so there needs to be the ability for Unite and Pleasant Valley to pump in late in the season, regardless of how much water comes in to meet those demands. Um, we have set them at 50% of United's PTP and Pleasant Valley County's extractions um, during the base period. Uh, that works well in our modeling. Uh, Pleasant Valley indicated they may have some operational data to uh, for what that minimum is, but that, that was not provided. So um, that's what we have moved forward with, and that uh, appears to provide sufficient water for those needs. Um, and the uh, United's re required to provide a, a report each year about the water that was made available to Pleasant Valley and to the pumping trough pipeline. And uh, um, 
United has to deliver those and, and so does PV if they're made available. For, excuse me for a sec. Again, these slides are the same as what you saw in June. Um, for uh, Pleasant Valley County's extraction for any year that the PV de deliveries fall below the base period, del PV deliveries um, of 98.48 acre feet, Pleasant Valley's extraction allocations increased by that amount. And in any year, the PV uh, Santa Clara River deliveries to the PV system exceeds the base period PV deliveries. Their uh, extraction allocation is decreased by the amount of the surplus, but this is new, not less than the minimum allocation of 50%. Of Can I just clarify one thing? When you say, but not less than the minimum allocation, I'm not sure that that clearly identifies what's not less than, but the I think we're trying to say is that their allocation will not be decreased less than the minimum allocation of 50%. That's what we mean, correct? That is what we mean. It may be more clearly stated in the ordinance than I've stated yeah. here. Tried to shortcut it okay. or uh, shorthand it here. In yeah, the because because to some extent that could be read to say, but the decrease won't be less than 50% of the minimum allocation, saying, you know, it could be interpreted if the, if the water is, exceeds it by one acre foot, they could have a a fifty percent drop if you interpret it, but uh, I'll check I'll check the language here to make sure. Yes, your your interpretation is correct. That's the minimum amount of the allocation, um, and then it's a similar thing for United's PTP extraction allocations, um, and that those base period deliveries were fifty seven hundred fifty two acre feet, and fifty percent the minimum. Allocation for United is 50% of United's base period extraction allocations, 1,026 acre feet. So those uh, operations are reviewed um, for the purpose of meeting the uh, cumulative extractions and are compared to the cumulative allocations over a five-year period. Um, if the extractions exceed the, the cumulative extractions exceed the cumulative allocations, then there's a potential, or there is a subject to surcharges for that excess extraction. And one of the things that we've talked with stakeholders and with your executive committee about is the fact that presently, um, we don't have a good way to tie those extractions by both Pleasant Valley and United to the customers, their customers' extractions. And we know that when we've looked at this on sort of a, a broad basis, that we do see when the purveyor's extractions increase and there's more deliveries, the customer extractions decrease correspondingly. And overall, there is a net um, uh, not a net increase in extraction. Uh, neither United or Pleasant Valley have been able to tie those together and the reporting to the agency does not provide that. However, staff recommends that as we do these five-year reviews, and we'll look at them annually as well leading up to five years, we won't just wait five years, that um, for context, we look at where uh, the total extraction by on both ends, the closed system, if you will, rather than the open system of both the extractions by the customers and the purveyors um, and the total extraction. So we see whether on balance, whether those extractions are greater than the total allocation. If that's the case, that's a problem. If they are uh, within the total allocation, then that is not a net detriment to the basin. Um, we. Uh, anticipate that the increased reporting that was being required by this ordinance for the ultimate transition to land base will provide us that information in order to be able to do that moving forward. Um, in terms of reporting, nothing has changed uh, regarding the reporting, so I'll go through these rather quickly uh, and um, unless there's a question on one. But again, the, the purpose of the uh, 
much more uh, detailed reporting is to re really try and understand where the water is being put uh, on a parcel basis so that we can ultimately move to a land-based system. Um, these are the requirements for ag reporting by mutual water companies, special districts, and municipalities that, that provide groundwater or in lieu deliveries for ag irrigation. Um, m and water purveyor reporting. Um, we're not getting into the same detail within those, dis those service areas. Um, individual domestic and m and reporting uh, really is, is just a little bit increased from what we have now in terms of uh, reporting the parcels supplied by the water. So that's a quick review of uh, the reporting. In terms of allocation carryover, um, back in uh, last year, your executive committee held a workshop to talk about allocation carryover. There was initially a lot of reticence by your board to implement carryover, um, but um, stakeholders uh, really expressed a need for carryover, especially to even out hydrologic cycles. And, uh, and your board in September 2018 uh, said that an operator came up with these principal uh, guidelines that an operator may carry over up to 50% of the unused annual allocation in any year, but that would top out at a maximum of 100% of current year annual allocation that can be carried over. And at such time in the future, if those reduced, then it would be the reduced allocation in that fall in that year. Um, your board uh, directed that first water in in any water year is the, uh, or first water used in any uh, reporting year would be deemed an exercise of the carried over water and that the carried over allocation expires after five years. Now there was concern by stakeholders, um, principally uh, initially United and Pleasant Valley, um, but others that um, their systems uh, really operate as a single system and that the carryover should be uh, applied to the system as a whole. We had uh, included that and applied that to all water purveyors um, who had a system like that. Uh, others, uh, private pumpers said, well, we operate a similar system and it seems like it should apply to us. We talked about this at the executive committee um, and uh, and the executive committee's recommendation was just to apply the annual allocation carryover um, across the, the extraction facilities combined into a comp code and just evenly divided among those combined extraction facilities. Um, we couldn't carry it over into the combined comp code. We need to have it down to the extraction facility because these com a lot of the comp codes, especially with the lease operators, the wells come in and out and they change and we have to have a way to track it to the well. For those operators where it doesn't change from year to year, it's the same as if it's combined because they can pull their allocation the next year. So this, um, this was actually a really elegant way to handle this and I think it um, addresses everybody's concern. And then this provision's been in there since uh, the advent of the carryover that uh, your board may uh, limit the use of carryover allocations as long as it applies equally to all operators in any year consistent provisions of the GSP. Kim, I got a question for you about that. Make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, earlier in the presentation, you were talking about how operators can combine their com code allocations and move them around from wellhead to wellhead representing that if there's a breakdown or mechanical failure that we don't have stranded water in any given year. With the allocation carryover now being equally applied to all those wellheads, is that also able to be moved within a year? Or is it just going to start off there in January and how I decide to use it in July or by the end of the year? Can I roll that back up again? So the way that would work, Director Ranio, is, is in a com code, there really isn't there isn't a transfer. What happens is 
as far as the agency is concerned, if I'm an operator and I have three wells in a comm code, whatever the allocation of those three wells, I combine that and I'm reporting against that. Fine. And then as long as the extraction of those three wells combined doesn't exceed that combined allocation, then, um, then I'm good. In terms of, uh, and that's the way it works now, okay. um, and that would continue. Um, but if there is, let's say my three wells have... Um, 100 acre feet. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something I can divide by three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so 100 acre feet, but I've only, um, I've only pumped uh, 60 acre feet. So I have a carryover, well, let's say 70 acre feet, and I have a carryover of 30 acre feet. For tracking purposes, 20 acre feet carryover goes to each of those three wells. No matter how they were operated, it goes to carry over in the next year. If I continue with that comm code, then all that gets pulled into the next year. However, if one of those wells is broken out, sold, or moved, that, that carryover moves over with that well. So. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One other question for you. Could you go back one slide, please? Your bottom point, the board may limit use of carryover allocations of all operators in any year consistent with provisions of the GSP. And my question for, for, is for Al for this one. With that provision, uh, the, the board can limit the carryover allocations of all operators. Are we, do we need to be clear so that we're not at any risk of somebody saying, well, if you limit my use of this carryover allocation, then the five years shouldn't count, and I should get five years beyond that? Or will the five years still apply if we limit the use of the carryover allocation? I, I don't have any policy agenda here. I just want us to be clear from a legal standpoint so we don't have to resolve that later. I, I'm not sure. Uh, the ordinance as drafted doesn't specify one way or the other. Uh, what it contemplates, though, is that that decision, when that decision is made by your board, uh, we would address the, an issue such as the one that you raised. Well, if this is an ordinance, you'd have to change the ordinance to have the carryover allocation be more than five years, wouldn't you? Uh, well, the the limitation as as written, uh, I would interpret as as broad enough to uh, give your board the, the discretion to to suspend that aspect of the ordinance in terms of the five years. So, it's uh, in a sense it's a to be determined provision. So it's. As written, it doesn't say one way or the other. Well, I'm sorry, but th that answer now concerns me. If, if the carryover allocation expires after five years is not a hard and fast part of this ordinance, it needs to be, right? I don't mind if the board limits the use of the carryover if we had to do that, but I don't want it to be, I don't want the carryover provision to be, well, that could be changed by the board at any time without changing the ordinance. I mean... Otherwise, we're going to get, yeah. Well, I, I guess as a further uh, thought on that, the, by, by, by limiting it, it wouldn't, that, that at least implies that the five-year limit on carryover couldn't be changed by your board by subsequent action, that, that a limitation would be a further reduction, not okay. an expansion on the five-year. Thank you. So the ordinance contains allocation transfer uh, provisions. These have been rewritten. Uh, the uh, previous draft that you saw had um, language about before adoption of the GSP and after the adoption of the GSP um, as we come close to adopting the GSP or your board considers adoption of the GSPs uh, in December. Uh, it seemed like there would be language in there that uh, wouldn't apply, and especially since the ordinance becomes effective after the GSPs are in effect. Uh, that was simplified. Um, during the simplification in the working draft, we inadvertently uh, removed temporary assignments, uh, but we got some comments on that. That's back in there, and now I think it reads the same as it did in terms of um, function, but it 
uh, gets rid of some redundant text. And uh, your board had previously directed that um, intra-basin transfers can be approved by the executive officer, but inter-basin transfers requires a board approval. And your board also had indicated uh, that when irrigated acreage changes to M and I use, the allocation would transfer on a one-to-one -one basis. That's kind of a placeholder for when uh, we move to uh, land base, um, because now it would be by the uh, extraction facility if it should move to an M and I use. But that allocation at the extraction facility would remain the same regardless of the use. So reductions of allocations, um, the ordinance says that if the sustainable yield is less than the total extraction allocations uh, established by the ordinance, then your board will determine an allocation reduction methodology following adoption of the GSP. That's what your board has previously um, directed. Pleasant Valley, in our uh, meetings with them, had indicated there was concern by some operators in their area that um, th that there be language that it would not be that they would not be disadvantaged by taking system water in terms of their allocation. So we've added language in response to PV's request on that, basically stating that operators. Use of surface water and lieu to groundwater after the effective date of the ordinance shall not subject that operator to a greater allocation reduction than is imposed on other operators. And then there was some um, unnecessary language, I think was uh, in, uh, in what well, was in this section, specifically addressing PTP and PV surface water flexibility allocations um, that. Uh, PV had some concerns, I, maybe you and I, but PV did, and uh, we reviewed in context that that was really unnecessary because uh, your board has that general review of the uh, overall review of the ordinance to see uh, its effectiveness and um, state intent that would modify the ordinance if needed based on that review. Uh, and also your board had stated that you wanted to have set an intent that in a future reduction uh, evaluation that there would be some minimum allocation acre foot per acre for agricultural operators as part of that allocation reduction uh, methodology. So uh, variances, the variance language remains the same. As uh, I mentioned at the uh, beginning, that staff uh, has been working with the uh, executive committee to address the, the policy recommendations for variance implementation to address pumpers with less than 10 years of pumping data. Uh, we've made good progress. The executive committee has given us some very good direction. We will be coming back to them and then ultimately to your full board with those recommendations. But those recommendations for how to implement the ordinance so it, uh, it's not a holdup to adopting the ordinance. So effective and operative dates. So the ordinance would become effective 31 days after adoption, <coughs> your board adopted today in 31 days, but become fully operative in October 1, 2020. So the reason for that recommendation, um, uh, there's several reasons for that. One is we will be moving to a water year under the GSP management. We're past that water year start date now, which was October 1st. It's October 1st through January 30th is the water year. Um, but um, more important than that, this will give us ample time to provide notification to operators and owners of what their new allocation is going to be, run that variance process for those operators who feel that they have uh, some situation that the agency should consider uh, issuing a variance for, and also to give us the, uh, the time to put in the administrative systems to manage the new ordinance. 
So that's the end of my presentation. Our recommendations are to receive and file this presentation, conduct a public hearing, this is a public hearing, and consider adoption of the ordinance. Questions or comments from the members of the board? When we then, um, we will, thank you, Kim, we'll con convene a public hearing um, at this time and invite members of the public with questions or comments to come forward. I will note for the record as well, we've received comment letters from Ventura Water Zone Mutual, from Council for OPV Coalition and Oxnard PV Ag Owners, from uh, Mr. Saperstein's office, from uh, Dira Family Farms, and from the city of Oxnard. So those of you who submitted these letters, if you want to make comments, feel free. Don't repeat the letters. We've read them. We don't need you, don't need you to read them to us. Thanks. Uh, afternoon, Chair West, members of the board, Jared Bouchard, general manager at the Pleasant Valley County Water District. You mean I can't just get up here and reread the letter? You can if you wish, but I don't know how effective it'll be. <laughs> Um, actually, uh, I'm going to read from something else. Are any of you guys uh, familiar <laughs> with uh, Assembly Bill 2995? It's your enacting legislation for the GMA. I'm going to read from one of the definitions in the enacting legislation as it defines the term conjunctive use. It means a coordinated operation of a groundwater basin and groundwater and surface water supplies. Conjunctive use includes increased groundwater use or decreased groundwater replenishment with surface supplies in years when surface supplies are less than normal and in years of more abundant surface supplies. The increased use of surface water in lieu of groundwater, either to allow groundwater levels to recover or to replenish artificial groundwater supplies. Conjunctive use also includes long-term storage in water and groundwater basins. That's what the term means in this room. It's what it means to this agency. I'm just here to remind the board that we have submitted no less than four times comments related to the use of Santa Clara River water and thus far have some of those substantive changes that we've requested have not been included. This dates back to February of this year. We've provided two very easy changes to address use of conjunctive use water, surface water in the ordinance. We're a little frustrated by the gymnastics that we've gone through in the ordinance language to address conjunctive use water. So we would just ask again that you look at the letter we submitted. We've submitted it on three times when the draft came out October 3rd, which we appreciate staff working with us and sending it early. We didn't re re receive a response to it, nor were they included, so we again submitted the letter to your board uh, in anticipation of this. There's a much simpler way to deal with it. We understand the board's inability to walk. While we don't agree with it, we understand the board's inability to walk back to a true one water approach, so we've tried to be constructive. And this is, again, an attempt to ask you to consider those simple changes that take away a lot of the burden, the complexity of this ordinance going forward with accomplishing the same goal, both in the reduction of groundwater when surface water is available, it does the same thing for you. It takes away some of the complicit, or, uh, complicated accounting that, that we have to go through um, and just seems like a more reasonable approach than, than what we're looking at here. So we just ask that you take those comments into consideration and consider including them in your ordinance. Thank you, John. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Good afternoon, Chairman West and members of the board. For the record, my name is Sophia Lee, and I'm a registered professional geologist with Naval Facilities Engineering and Expeditionary Warfare Center. And I provide the following remarks on behalf of Amanda Fagan, the Community Planning Liaison Officer for Naval Base Ventura County, who had to leave for another commitment. We greatly appreciate the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, that the Groundwater 
agency has recognized that water is critical to military sustainability, resiliency, and compatibility, and in accordance with SIGMA, language recognizing federal water use and the federal reserve water rights has been incorporated into the draft Oxnard Subbasin Groundwater Sustainability Plan. However, we are, remain concerned that such recognition has not also been incorporated into the proposed groundwater allocation ordinance. As noted in our letter dated July 17, 2019, the GSP and follow-on management actions should provide for an allocation of water to meet current and future U.S. Navy and Air Force missions and anticipated growth. Since the allocation ordinance is a key component of management actions to implement the GSP, the ordinance should be consistent with the GSP. In addition, we are concerned that the staff report for today's hearing is silent on this issue and does not respond to the July 17th letter. During the June 26th public hearing on the allocation ordinance, the board directed staff to incorporate federal water use into the GSP and allocation ordinance. In response, NBVC provided suggested armed forces operator language to Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. The staff report for today's board consideration of the revised draft ordinance does not address federal water use, nor does the proposed ordinance incorporate federal water use beyond the brief reference to the extent authorized under federal law in the definition of person. We believe that the GMA should acknowledge proposed language and explain the reasoning behind the decision not to provide additional clarity regarding federal water use given the deviation from the board's direction on June 26th. Simply put, the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency staff report should show its work in considering stakeholder input and making decisions about what to include or exclude from the ordinance. As always, we remain committed to being a good steward of water resources and to exploring partnerships that help to achieve groundwater sustainability, including projects that benefit both the Navy and our neighbors. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Anyone else? Jurgen Gramco, Southland Sod Farm. Um, I'm just going to tick off a few things um, just going through the uh, various articles in the in the ordinance. In the definition section, we're talking about management areas, and I'm going to quote part of it. It says, shall mean an area within the basins with different minimum thresholds, measurable objectives, et cetera. And my question is, will property owners in a management area be made whole in regard to any special restraints placed on their groundwater use? Uh, that is, will they be supplied with alternate water? We think it's important to make a statement of uh, guaranteeing some equity. After all, if, if you're going to place special restraints on a management area, then folks in that management area ought to have a guarantee that they're going to be treated fairly. That is to say, you're going to get alternate water to them so that there's less groundwater used. So that sort of fundamental statement of equity is, is what I'm looking for. Um, in the general provisions, we're talking about OH pipeline. It says the OH pipeline is held in trust by United for any or all contractors as a sub allocation. <coughs> what I'd like to see is an additional statement that says we would like to see an acknowledgement that included in those sub allocations is an agricultural is the agricultural water use taken during the base period by the Ocean View Water District. That needs to be a set aside as well. Um, and then in the allocation carryover, I um, understand that dividing the uh, carryover among wells in a com code equally is a simple solution and easy to implement. And I don't object to it on its face, but <clears throat> what I'm concerned about is those of us that that uh, use the COM code have wells that during the base period were a lot more productive than they are today. We've got two of them that really don't produce much uh, agricultural water. We just use them now to fill water trucks, but they still have 
a, a, an allocation on them that's pretty big. So we combine that into our comp code and it all works out. But if we get into a point in time where we're accumulating um, unused allocation and we can't use it up in the following year, I don't want it to get stranded out here on wells that aren't getting a lot of use. So what I think we'd like to have is a, just a ministerial process where we went to the GMA staff and said, look, I've got this extra um, unused allocation sitting over here on a well that isn't producing what it used to produce. I want to move it over here to a well that is producing. And um, I, I think that seems pretty reasonable in the face of the fact that, you know, if you if you own all the wells, and you're managing all the wells, you ought to be able to move the the unused allocation around as needed. And then, lastly, on the um, flex allocation, I um, continue to be confused by how complicated this has gotten. I. Um, I, I thought the fundamental concept was that PV and United could pump groundwater to, to replace unavailable surface water in dry years <clears throat> as long as they took surface water avail that was available in wet years. So you start with your, your uh, baseline allocation, which was the groundwater pumped during that baseline, the surface water delivered during that baseline. You combine it. And to the extent that in subsequent years you have wet years, you take more surface water. And to the extent you have dry years, you take more groundwater. But the total never exceeds the original allocation. I think it's what people are referring to as the one water approach. And from where I sit, I, it seems to me that that's what was originally envisioned. It seems like that's the most straightforward and, and equitable approach. So I would. Uh, I would just want to put my support towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Greg Lewis, Duda Farms. Duda is a landowning, celery farming, processing packer, shipper here in the Oxnard Plains. And um, thank you, Director Ronio, for your time. In your service, your time away from the podium as well as behind the desk. Um, I want to just hit on a couple points made. There's been a lot of talk about the ag v m and i increases and decreases, and to echo some words spoken, can't remember which director mentioned it, but it's it should be viewed as an overall basin approach. The GMA's goal, now GSA goal, is to really manage the groundwater within the basin, whether that groundwater is extracted for m &I purposes or for ag purposes. And to quote some of the directors at the executive committee meetings as well as the board meetings, if our goal is to achieve no net increase and no negative impact on the basin, why are we now considering adopting an allocation proposal that immediately increases both the m &I and the ag folks' ability to extract on day one. It, it, it seems to violate the GMA's mantra of no net increase. But on day one, the 2005 to 2014 base period allows both communities to extract far more water than they're using today, which results in exactly what Mr. Loeb said, just sharper cutbacks. So here we are today. Here's the 2005 to 14 base period. So take us from here to here just to bring us right back down here again. All of that flying in the face of a plan that is working. And when I mean working, I'm talking, I'm talking about the IAI. <clears throat> Mr. Loeb has on several occasions demonstrated data on the display that shows a trending downward application number for ag applied water. That data set is in front of you in charts. And each year since the April 2014 implementation of Emergency Drought Ordinance E, 
overall ag applied water continues in the downward direction. Yet some directors believe that IAI is not working. True, it did not achieve its 20% goal in two years as we were hoping, but we were flying in the face of historic drought conditions. And even in those conditions, the ag community still managed to decrease its overall applied water, district surface water, as well as groundwater. But all of that, we want to do away with that plan and adopt a plan that on its first day increases all of our ability to pump. To me, it, it just, common sense is lost on an ordinance that if we're trying to reduce the overall extractions in the basin, to immediately increase them on day one of the implementation of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, Tom Deardorff with Deardorff Family Farms. We are a landowner and farming entity operating in the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. Uh, I submitted a letter as, as the chair indicated and at the risk of uh, being further <laughs> objectified, I won't mention anything in that letter. Um, somebody owns all that land in OPV, right? I mean, we can walk across the hall and they can tell us exactly who owns all that land. Underneath that land is a pool of water. Somebody owns all that water. It's called groundwater, right? And so people have straws that go into that water, and, and we all own a share of that water. Today, when I walked in the door, I kind of knew what, we, what I owned, except after your guys' vote, you just gave away 10,000 acre feet of the water that's underneath my land and all the land of the people in this room. So the reason we're constantly having this unsuccessful dialogue and M&I did this and AG did this and this is the goals of the GMA and these are why we should continue to ignore the goals of the GMA type of discussions is because you guys won't put your cards on the table. There's a legal situation going on, right? You guys are deciding who owns that water. And today, you took 10,000 acre feet of water away from a certain group of people, and you gave it to another group of people. And this allocation is going to do that also. And it's going to do it permanently. And you guys aren't showing us your cards. We've never had an open, honest discussion about the legal rights of what's going on in the OPV district. Yeah, we trade numbers and charts and your staff won't give you the most recent charts, but certain members of the community will come and meet with Mr. West and provide them with that numbers. And some will say that we use more and some will say that we use less. Bottom line is somebody owns that water. Who owns it? Why don't you guys tell us who you think owns it? Rather than making these allocation plans, oh, let's just push a little there, let's push a little there. The only reason the result that you're talking about with Mr. Lewis explained why we're going back up is because somebody in this room thinks that it's a 60-40 allocation. And the only way to get to 60-40 is to bump us back up under this stupid new number. So then you can ramp us down sharper because somebody in this room thinks it's 60-40. Some lawyer told you, some maybe you guys have the legal analysis. Until we can all get in a room and have an open, honest discussion and talk about this thing, let's get a third party facilitator. Let's resolve it here before we resolve it across the hallway. That's the most viable solution for the OPV district. It's not to adopt an ordinance a year before you're going to use it. It's to get real. We need to get real and have some discussions. And yes, there's a lot of good points in these letters. And we're not going to make them all again here today right now. So let's spend some time and get it done correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, directors. Uh, Eric Ryder, Ryder Affiliated Companies. Grove Berry's here, been here since 78. Also uh, landowners in the OPV Basin. Um, I think there's a lot of frustration, obviously, um, being expressed by the group here. Uh, when you look at what government and private, um, private enterprise have been able to do, in when you partner and actually come up with something that works for both parties, it's pretty powerful. I think the Great Water Project here was an example where you had a couple private 
uh, parties, including ourselves, and work with the city and look at all the water that's being produced. Um, there's none of it's perfect, but you've also got um, what United did with um, the pipeline that then reduced pumping out of the wells. Um, it, I think that you look at what's happening now, and obviously the partnership has not been there. There has been a lot of stakeholder input. Um, to be frank, I think it's gotten a lip service. Um, you have the majority of the group here uh, strongly opposing what's being proposed, uh, and just a couple people supporting. And that doesn't seem like a partnership between pr the private enter enterprises here, um, or companies, and, uh, and, and your team or your board. Um, so uh, I think what Tom mentioned makes sense, a third party facilitator to get everyone together and try and figure this out before we all end up in a courtroom. Um, that's what I think most of this group's been doing is getting lawyers because we see this going that route and we have to protect our interests and uh, what we've created over the last generations here uh, in, in uh, Ventura County. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair West, board members, and the GMA staff. My name is Sherry Klima. I represent the city of Oxnard. Um, first, regarding the allocations of the Santa Clara River and uh, water in the Conejo Creek, this is preferential treatment of United and Pleasant Valley and corresponding unfair treatment of the city of Oxnard because of the met water that the city purchased. Um, Section 702 of the GMA's enabling statute says, and I quote, the availability of supplemental water to any operator shall not be subject, shall not subject that operator to regulations more restrictive than those imposed on other operators. The city's extraction allocation is based solely on its base period allocation which is determined by Oxnard's extraction as reported to the agency during that base period. Um, during that period, Oxnard's groundwater extraction was reduced by its purchase of imported supplemental water from Cayegas. However, in contrast, Section 1.1.1 of the Allocation Ordinance says that Pleasant Valley's base period allocation is increased in an amount equal to the base period Conejo Creek water deliveries. Um, and then again, there's an increase with respect to the SCR water. That's not being afforded to the city of Oxnard. That's not equal treatment. To adhere to section 702, the GMA must account for the city's use of supplemental water by increasing Oxnard's base period allocation by the same amount. Now, if there were no availability of Cayegas water to the city, the city would have had to pump the additional water. We've got, you know, a certain number of users. We've got certain user rates in that time period. You can look at the differential between what we pumped versus what our users used, and you can see we would have had to make up that difference in one way or another. So we would have had to pump the additional groundwater if we didn't have met water available to us. And the base period allocation would have been increased by that amount. So to prevent a violation of the GMA's Act Section 702, if you want to keep the SCR and Conejo Creek allocations, the city requests an increase to its base period allocation. The legal concerns exacerbated when you look at the legislature's definition of supplemental water. If you look at section 323 of the GMA's enabling legislation, it defines supplemental water as surface water or groundwater imported from outside the watershed of the groundwater basin and floodwaters that are conserved and saved within the watershed, which would otherwise have been lost or would not have reached the groundwater basin or aquifers. The Santa Clara River water does not meet this definition. That means that United and PV's use of Santa Clara River water doesn't invoke the protection of Section 702 that I read to you before. In contrast, Oxnard's imported water from Cayegas clearly falls into this definition. So the GMA cannot legally ignore Oxnard's request for an allocation if it intends to grant the allocations, the extra water that we're currently supplying by the written uh, 
ordinance to unite it in Pleasant Valley. So I think you do have a choice. You can either increase Oxnard's allocation. That's not been our request so far, but you can either do that or if you're looking to make this equitable and in line with this uh, statute otherwise, then you can also remove the preferential treatment. That's the additional allocations for the SCR water and the Conejo Creek water. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to talk to Jared or John, or the, the other the folks from Pleasant Valley or from United about this, um, but if they are comfortable with increasing Oxnard's allocation instead of reducing the two extra allocations, then we're certainly comfortable with that option. Secondly, um, Oxnard appreciates GMA staff's very hard work in including the OH pipeline language. That was a big ordeal. Um, that was also a, a big effort on United's part, and we appreciate them working with us. There's only one minor revision left, and that's in the definition of the OH pipeline in section 4.22. Um, either you can remove that definition entirely. I don't think there's any harm in removing that definition, or just remove the phrase owned and operated by United. Um, that's because, and if you look at our agreement, you can look at this, other entities have proportionate shares of ownership in that infrastructure. It is not 100% owned by United. So this is just factually inaccurate. And then third, uh, and this is my final point, CEQA isn't properly addressed in the ordinance. Um, the ordinance would implement a new pumping allocation system for the basins. Um, the Conejo Creek project and Santa Clara River water flex allocations, if you decide to include them, are also going to influence surface water as well. So, but the proposed ordinance claims it's exempt from environmental review under CEQA. Now, as you all know, and the ordinance cites to Water Code Section 10.728.6 and CEQA, three different CEQA guideline sections to say it's exempt. But as you all know, CEQA exemptions require a discussion or some kind of analysis, a rationale for relying on those exemptions. You can't just say we are exempt and cite the section number. You have to explain that exemption. And the staff report doesn't do that, and the ordinance doesn't do that, so this is not compliant with CEQA. Um, otherwise, if you don't spell out why these exemptions are applicable, you have to prepare an initial study of the ordinance to determine whether there are any significant effects on the environment, and then determine whether you'd like to rely on a negative declaration or prepare an EIR. Um, the agency can only consider adoption of this ordinance after a full and lengthy CEQA review has been completed, or if you're choosing to rely on exemptions, that you actually do the full exemption explanation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair West and board members. My name is Bert Perlow, uh, City Councilman in Oxnard, District 1. First, I'd like to take a moment. Thank you for your service on this board, Mr. Arano. Until someone sits in the shoes of an elected official, they don't realize the price you pay with your service. So thank you for your service. <clears throat> First, your board already stated its intention for the Santa, that the Santa Clara River water and Caneo Creek water was to be borrowed and returned if recognized at all, not granted an additional allocation. It's not clear to me why these changes aren't reflected in the ordinance after so many drafts. I'll be blunt. This isn't legal. You just heard from Ms. Klima. Oxnard's residents or any city's residents involved in this, age, in this underlying Fox Canyon groundwater management shouldn't be treated unfairly. We shouldn't have to pay more than any other resident for their water. The city intends to protect its legal rights. You can either increase Oxnard's allocation in the ordinance or remove the additional allocations for the SCR water and the Caneo Creek water. Oxnard doesn't object to the borrowing mechanism, but there needs to be clear, simple language in the allocation ordinance for a common man or woman to understand that the same amount of water that was borrowed must be, re must be underpumped in the future. Second, there is no method in this ordinance or in any of the GSP for the impact that we'll have, if any, on credits and allocations. 
We need to know what will happen to those credits and allocations. This can't be left unsaid. There's a lot of money riding on those. Third, Oxnard had no objections to the effective date, Ox, beg your pardon, Oxnard had objections to the effective date of the ordinance being a year out. But if the MNI's 20% pumping restriction under emergency ordinance E is being repealed, we are less concerned. But please keep on staff to bring this repeal back to you promptly. Fourth, allocation ordinance section 10.2 is, problem, is problematic at what, as well. This section says the GMA board intends to exempt agricultural operators from reductions until such time as the board determines that a reduction of the minimum allocation is necessary in order to facilitate implementation of the GSP. No operator should be subject to reductions unless the board determines it is necessary to implement the GSP. So identifying agricultural operators for preferential treatment is unfair, arbitrary, and therefore illegal. Section 10.2 should be deleted from the ordinance. Fifth, Article 8 in the ordinance as currently drafted discourages efforts to conserve groundwater. The third sentence requires the first water used in any year to be exercise of carryover, to be an exercise of carryover, should be deleted. We want to encourage the conservation of groundwater. We all do. Oxnard appreciates the efforts of the GMA staff has invested in, re in the revise of this allocation ordinance in response to the prior commitments. We are confident that the remaining issues can be addressed. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Bert. Anyone else? Good afternoon, Chair West, members of the board. My name is Russell McLaughlin from the O'Melveny Law Firm. I represent the OPV Coalition and the Oxnard uh, PV Ag Owners, Inc. Together, those entities represent um, uh, approximately 75% of the basins, uh, the combined basins, irrigable farmland, and most of the largest and longstanding agricultural entities uh, in the basins. Together, uh, they oppose, the OPV group uh, opposes the draft ordinance because it is inequitable and unlawful for the reasons stated in a letter that I submitted to you of today's date, um, not to repeat that letter, but to hit the highlight points, and notably it penalizes growers that have conserved water, it strands certain parcels of land without allocation, it provides an unjustified windfall of allocation to some high-use growers at the expense of others. It is unlawful because it fails to appreciate um, the equity and the equitable treatment that's required by case law and statutes, particularly when we are speaking about divisions of groundwater among landowners holding correlative water rights. The, the ordinance, as you heard earlier, also vi violates CEQA for the same reasons uh, stated by the City of Oxnard. Similar statements are in our letter, uh, which I would direct you to. Personally, I appreciate the difficulty in cultivating an ordinance that satisfies the various interests that you're hearing here today and the competing notions of what is equitable and what is lawful. I've spent almost two decades now studying, negotiating, and litigating the complexities of water law and particularly groundwater management. It is a complex field. It has many nuances. I don't stand before you today and proclaim that I have a specific answer or that there is particularly a specific answer. That would need to be decided by the courts under various uh, legal factors, uh, both factual evidence and applicable law. I know the, the arguments. I know the ambiguities. But I can say this, a simplistic approach, for example, the use of a 10-year base period that began nearly 15 years ago is not the right result, and I don't believe it will withstand legal scrutiny. Neither equity nor applicable law is that simple. The OPV group, as you know, spent years developing a white paper proposal that provides that necessary nuance, compromise. The majority of the agricultural users in the basin supported that white paper. Some prominent high, agricultural, high use users did not. What this tells us is that there is still plenty of work to be done to reach a compromise. And compromise is what 
this will ultimately end up, but I assure you that. In the history of the major groundwater allocation conflicts in the state, almost every one of them has ultimately resulted in a substantial settlement. Yes, there may be litigated issues along the way, but ultimately, because we are repeat players and we are not dealing with zero-sum negotiation, but complex dynamics of groundwater management, you'll ultimately settle. The only real, really relevant question before you today is how much pain, expense, and hostility you may entail in litigation before you get there. OPV Group urges you to, you, to take a different course. Let's start a new round of negotiation with professional assistance to seek a mutually acceptable ordinance. We haven't tried that yet here. There has not been a, a, the, a request to use mediation professional facilitators to resolve these conflicts. Just last week, Stanford University, uh, Water in the West produced a paper, and I, I encourage you to look it up online, encouraging GSAs to do, do just that to try to address these conflicts through professional facil facilitation outside of the courts. It encouraged the state to make a, 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 a broad group of competent facilitators to do that and put funding before it. There are those organizations. If there was the interest, we could certainly find um, appropriate facilitator. In other conflicts of water management state, that is exactly what they're doing. For example, an adjudication was recently filed for the Fresno River um, the, that was received by the State Water Board for a statutory adjudication. The party said, maybe we could work this out. The State Board said, absolutely. Why don't we give you a nine-month hiatus on the prosecution of that petition for adjudication and send you to facilitation? They've hired Kearns and West, and that process is underway. Perhaps they reached a solution. So our argument or our pitch to you is let's push the fast forward button. Let's get in a room and start negotiating these differences. There's no simple answers. If you need to, to hear one another, you need to engage in empathetic listening. You gotta ask all to ultimately, you know, dig deep, sometimes hold your nose and reach compromise. Otherwise, it appears that we're gonna be heading for litigation in which court is probably gonna mandate that you do that, just that. Go into a courtroom, go into a mediation room with a professional mediator, precisely what's happening in Las Postas uh, adjudication presently, and see if you can work it out. Why do we need to do litigation first? A far better approach is to do this now. I know that the landowner group that I represent is willing to do so. Question is the GMA. Thank you. Mr. McLaughlin? Yes, sir. I have a question for you. When the OPV group was meeting, when the OPV group was meeting and you were having conflicts and you weren't reaching agreement, did you um, bring in a outside uh, neutral third party mediator? Yeah, uh, I was not representing specifically the OP group, PV group at the time. And no, I do not aware, not believe there has been any attempt to do comprehensive facilitation. Mm -hmm. That is something that the GMA would have to embrace and ask all of the parties to embrace. Because, I mean, there are no emerald cur curtains here. We all know where this ends up. And, and I th I, you have 75% of the agricultural landowners that I believe are willing to sit and pr partake in a specific facilitation. And your groundwater sustainability plan could say, this is our plan. We are going to start a structured, facilitated, scheduled. This is what it looks like. This, how, this is how much time. This is what we're going to do. I think the Department of Water Resources reviewing your plan would look incredibly favorable at that because that would understand that your, your board is committed to trying to resolve the elephant in the room, which is these complex water rights issues. So I know that you're probably, some of you are thinking, we've done a lot of talking, we've done a lot of negotiation. Thank you. you know, et cetera. But you haven't tried the process that is necessary when you bring in professionals to organize the, the numbers of, of competing users. Have there one, are people that are skilled in that. I have one other question for you. What's your understanding with the new, uh, when they came up with the new state legislation, what's your understanding in terms of the state's identification of who uh, owns the groundwater? Is it a public asset or is it a private asset from your <laughs> 
<laughs> Steve, uh, Director Bennett, the, 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 the textbook answer is that it is a public resource in which private rights can be, private appropriate rights can be obtained. Those rights are, by definition, usufructory. They're a right to use. They're not a right to own the molecules. The, the, the more nuanced and more difficult answer is that those private use rights, which are protected by the Fifth Amendment, are a form of private property, could go on sometimes, Thanks. pay taxes, et cetera. Th those are I the issues you've got to negotiate. Thank you. Russ, looking at the, given that the proposed ordinance doesn't become effective for essentially 12 months, what's to prevent us from adopting the ordinance and continuing to pursue the type of fac facilitation that you've suggested? It, it, that it, it, nothing is a specific answer. And, and if you are intent, and I would prefer and argue that you'd be better to postpone in order with the intention of putting that date out there because it doesn't uh, predetermine an outcome uh, that then needs to be, if you will, negotiated against. However, if you are intent on adopting the ordinance today, I would recommend that approach to see if there you can uh, encourage folks to hold off on pushing the litigation button and instead come into the room and see if they can settle it. Thank you. Any other public comments? All right, hearing none, we will close the public hearing. I have a return to question of support. A question. Um, two people from Oxnard said that they had unfair treatment uh, given the supplemental water to farmers and not to Oxnard because of the former agreement it was not equal treatment and asked that Oxnard allocation be increased or to remove the uh, re remove the uh, ad additional allocation regarding the uh, Santa Clara River water and the Canal Creek water. Uh, I'd like a response to that. Has, has staff, does staff have a re response? Is there, is there a reason we didn't also give, a tal give the credit to Oxnard? Well, a number of entities, both um, principally uh, M and I, have received um, and have purchased water, imported water through Cayagas, Metropolitan Water. Um, and we built on the work that was started by the OPV group back in those days. There was OPV Ag and OPV m and I group, and they met separately and amongst themselves. And uh, those meetings were uh, behind closed doors. Staff wasn't there, but we heard from the groups as they worked out um, negotiations and that that is sort of where the starting point was as I under as we as staff understood it um, when we move forward and uh, um, and I, I know that uh, um, Jeff was ultimately involved in those discussions as well and uh, so the two years of discussions, probably hard to summarize, but basically they'd come up with an agreement themselves, the group. Uh, and it was through marathon meetings, lots of hours, and included us. And uh, when they arrived at that initial split, all of those issues were considered to be um, a, a part of the consideration that got them to the split. I think that's essentially what Kim's saying. This idea of adding the Santa Clara River water to the, um, um, is a late one and has been probably the last eight or 12 months been discussed heavily. This is the first time that I've heard Oxnard say we wanted to add it to our allocation. So I think if we started to go back down that road, you know, they would probably have to reconvene and, and maybe split, split it differently than they did the first time around. Hope that helps. It, and I, th I think it would be worth adding that the, the Santa Clara River water for United and PV is essentially it's a borrowing. It's a net neutral um, 
they're supposed to reduce their water use corresponding to the increase. So it, it is a net neutral. Um, it's not an additional allocation in the long term. So I think that's an important uh, point. Dr. Kim, do you mind if I follow up on this particular Sorry. issue? Uh, so uh, I, I realize it was a late addition when we added. Um, at the time, Oxner did raise the issue, hey, if you're going to add for them, why don't you add for us, is how I remember it. And I thought there was a rationale for why PV and United deserved it more than Oxnard deserved it. And does anybody have that rationale? Well, as Kim pointed out, the, the PV was first about the Canadian Creek water and then later the Santa Clara River water. And as Kim points out, it's designed to give ag just flex, the flex that they need um, over different atmospheric periods. Um, and um, it's not an add to their allocation. And does that... Part so because it, because it was, for them, it was designed as a flex and for a municipal government like Oxnard, it wasn't designed to be a flex. That was it wasn't. Water and for at the risk of incurring the wrath of half the people in the room, when we looked at that split that they eventually arrived at amongst themselves, the, uh, it, the, the m and I pumping had never achieved those levels. There was a lot of... Um, it didn't seem as though it were warranted. So M and I got a slightly higher allocation. Yes, based upon the arguments they made with that group, and some of which were we bought state water. There were there were a whole number of issues that floated around in there. But at that, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't been in those conversations in more than a year. But my my recollection was with that split, they were safe. And then. Just to be clear, so we have it out there on the record, as we added back in Caneo Creek water and Santa Clara River water, that increased allocation comes out of the total or out of just the ag portion. So that so what happens is, um, if you will, it, the the allocation flexes. So um, they've got a groundwater allocation plus we added the of use Caneo Creek as the simplest example, and so that number is is a big number. But they're required to reduce their allocation number um, by the amount of those <coughs> groundwater deliveries, right? So it comes right off the top, groundwater stays. So that's the first thing that gets reduced. So in years where they don't have that, they're allowed to pump a little more. In years where they have more, that reduces their allocation. But, but the total share or impact of that is across the board, not just for ag. That, that's correct, Director Bennett. Um, under the current ordinance, there's no differentiation between ag and m and It's an allocation by well. But, but, but m and I did end up with a slightly higher allocation to, when they got the 60-40 split as part of some... Early by that, and the, the allocation they ended up with was more than we'd seen them pump historically. They had, so. right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments from the board? I have one. Al, we heard over and again that the uh, CEQA uh, I, uh, paragraph 1.9 is insufficient in this ordinance because there's no discussion or other challenges to it. Uh, can you respond to that? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I believe the findings adequately set forth the basis for the exemptions that are claimed. Um, this is a... Uh, uh, conservation measure and falls within the resource protection exemptions under the CEQA guidelines. Um, this, uh, we, we've also cited the Sigma exemption, um, and it, it is correct that that does not specifically apply to the adoption of an allocation ordinance, but as the, the findings recite, um, this ordinance is part of the process of transitioning from our past groundwater management uh, allocation system to this new system under Sigma. And so I would argue that it's, in a sense, part and parcel of the whole groundwater sustainability plan adoption Sigma implementation process. Um, so beyond that, I, I would 
to say it's my opinion that uh, we are properly relying on these uh, exemptions from CEQA and that we've uh, adequately established that those exemptions apply. Thank you. And one more question. Mm -hmm. um, it was brought up about uh, section 4.22, the OH pipeline definition says owned and operated, uh, and she said that it wasn't fully owned by United. Do we need to have owned in there? I don't think we have enough data in order to be able to respond to that. Um, I don't have knowledge off the top of my head as to the history of that line and the um, exact ownership of it. Um, it would be an issue that I would say we need United staff in order to respond to that. And I think that might be unfair to ask them at this point in time without having the contract and the uh, history behind it as to uh, opinion on that. I think the so, question is more to, is not, the question is not whether Oxnard own, uh, United owns it. The question is whether that word is necessary yeah, to exactly. the language, yeah. the, the definition, and I think it's also 5.5. Whether, whether, whether if you remove the word owned, you change the implication of either the definition or the app, its application. Could I ask Al? Do, do you see any reason why we need to identify who we believe owns it at this point in time? Can we just talk about the pipeline? Uh, I don't believe it's necessary. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said you didn't believe it was necessary. I suggest we remove the word owned and the words owned and. From 4.22 and 5.5? Yes. Tell me what line in 5.5. .5. It's on page 5 of 12. I got that. Oh, first line at the top. Ah, thank you. Yes. Uh, there was one more. Let me... Um, I think that was all. Uh, there was another uh, question. What about credits? This is not involving credits, but at some time we will need to talk about them. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. And uh, Kim, I have a number of questions for you. Just not that I'm questioning whether we do it or not, but I want to make sure I hear the rationale. Uh, that staff at least has at this point in time for why we have that particular part in the ordinance. Uh, the first one comes from um, the uh, the letter from uh, the Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek, uh, and that's um, their contention that Santa Clara River diversions are used for direct delivery. Just most importantly, and so the ordinance fails to recognize that there's a distinction without a difference whether Santa Clara River diversions are used for direct delivery or groundwater recharge. Instead, the ordinance places a disproportionate burden on those that make direct use of the Santa Clara River water. Um, so for, for the net result is a policy disincentive for those that can take direct delivery of surface water to maximize conjunctive use of available water resources, an unexplainable outcome. Do you have any thought about that comment from them in this? Well, Pleasant Valley has uh, continued to maintain a position that uh, they don't like the flex implementation. They feel that they should just be granted the plus, the an allocation for all the water. Right. Um, and uh, so that that's really been their position from which they've been arguing. And so they, uh, you know, that that's looking for problems with what we've implemented, I think. I, I don't agree with that. I think what we've done here is provided uh, significantly more flexibility than those operators uh, United and Pleasant Valley have certainly have had under past agency code, which regulated uh, groundwater only. And and the reason the reason why we should do it the way we're doing it is because it does actually mean you have to you have to take the surface water when it's available and rest the groundwater. Is that correct? Yes, we don't. We do want to do everything we can to encourage 
uh, operators to take surface water when it's available and to utilize these pipeline systems. These pipeline systems, both PTP and Pleasant Valley, uh, especially to the extent it's receiving surface water, are very beneficial to the basin. And you believe our policies do that? I believe our policy right, does that. My, my second question, um, and um, this comes from uh, the city of Oxnard, um, talking about um, Oxnard's repeatedly asked for the revisions to the allocation ordinance to make it clear that the excess groundwater pumping in dry years where surface water is less available is borrowed from the basin and must be paid back by reduced pumping in future years. Um, Oxnard has raised that issue, and I think it was in particular to United, correct, um, in, in terms of that so that the allocation doesn't get. Um, you have a, um, these requests have largely been ignored. I know we did spend some time on that, and one of the issues was whose water is it? Is it Oxnard's water? Is it United's water? When it doesn't get pumped, et cetera. Do you have any, uh, you, and you may not, there's so much going on here, you may not have any uh, initial response to why we are um, not identifying it as borrowed water per Oxnard's request. Well, Director Ben, I, I think that our language says the same thing, perhaps in a different way. It doesn't use the word borrowed, but it says that United or Pleasant Valley can increase their allocations or extractions when that water is not available, provided there's a corresponding decrease when it is available. Mm -hmm. So it is but, it's a borrowing. We just have not used that particular word. And I believe it probably makes it less clear whether it's Oxnard's credit or whether it's United's credit. Um, I know at least that was part of the issue out there. So, okay. Um, my third question, um, the uh, a complication of shifting from one well to another that Mr. Graham Cal raised. So if you got, so we have, we have an allocation, you know, you've, you've combined your wells, you have uh, excess, now it gets assigned to all of those wells. The way the ordinance is currently written, is it your understanding, and I'll ask our council also, that that gets allocated to, you know, there's a hundred, there's five wells and have a hundred acre feet extra, that's gonna be 20 acre feet per well. Um, is there a mechanism to be able to move it from one well to another? Uh, and if there is, what is that mechanism? And, and should there be, and what would be the policy implications if there is? And I'll ask well, anybody, staff, Kim, or uh, over here, or um, county council. Right. So, uh, Director Bennett, uh, one of the things your board reluctantly agreed to include carryover, and you were very mindful that you did not want to create a new credit system and wanted to keep it attached to wells. Um, right now, there is not a uh, method for in the ordinance for transferring among the wells, but in the case of, of Mr. Gramco or any other operator that is continuing to operate with the same wells within their operation com code, they're combining those allocations each year for the purpose of reporting, and then the carryover is just um, then applied back to those wells. And with the first water used is the, the carryovers deemed the first water extracted, um, then uh, I don't think the issue of getting stranded on a, a particular extraction facility is, uh, I don't know, we, we don't see that as, as a, an issue. Excuse me, and get, let me get to. Couldn't, couldn't, if you had that situation somehow, wouldn't a, wouldn't a variance request apply? Would, it could be used as. Yeah, that's what I thought from looking at the ordinance. And, and, and the advantage of having it be a variance request is in some situations it might make sense, but I guess you could because there's going to be, there, because as the water becomes increasingly valuable and the carryovers and all of that stuff, you could find people trying to use comp code to somehow manipulate the transfer of water around that, that you thought wasn't good for the basin and stuff. Okay. The, um, um, along that same line, Excuse me. Could, that could I add into that to maybe try and get some clarification too? Isn't it common when you have multiple wells that they are on one com code? If there's, and like the gram cows, let's just say they've got the five wells, is it practice that GMA 
puts all those five wells on just the one com code, or is there five com codes? Uh, it's practice that the owner operator um, can combine their extraction facilities into a com code. We have some com codes that um, operators have combined lots of wells throughout the basin into a single com code. And right now, that's the most discrete information, reporting information we have. That's been one of the, the problems and why we're asking for including more reporting. So um, that's done by the operator for their convenience. And uh, um, one of the reasons we need to track this back to the well is so that we can track it to the wellhead, which is the intent of this ordinance, so that down the road we can then track that to the land. I, okay, I follow that. But in terms of uh, being able to track carryover, if it's all just one com code and, and all of those well allocations are on one com code, it seems very, very simple. And if it's first water out, it's just, say it's 20 acre feet, that first 20 <laughs> acre feet is reduced off of the combined 100 acre feet. You can think of the com code as a single well. I think that's what you're saying. The, the, the uh, problem I thought that Mr. Gramco was talking about is if one of those peels off and goes somewhere else, um, uh, and then they may want to send some of that allocation with it. And that, that, would, that could simply be handled as a variance procedure. Okay. So I, I'd like to just revisit the question of if you have, uh, you know, a carryover allocation, Right now, the first water is that you use as your carryover. And what are the policy implications of that versus if the first water, if you couldn't use your carryover water until you used your whole allocation? Because we we've had some people say, hey, the first, what, we're actually decreasing incentive to conserve water by letting the first water be carryover water. Some people are saying, you should use your allocation before you get to use your carryover. Can you help me with what thinking you guys have gone through in terms of the policy implications? Can I jump into a couple of things that we sure. discussed? Mm -hmm. you know, one, one side benefit of that first in, first out approach is that you avoid um, wasting saved water in the sense that you'll, you won't lose it. If you're continuing to use water every year and you're saving some, that first water out is last year's carryover. Um, it shouldn't disincentivize saving because you're still going to be able to carry over at the end of that year. And you don't have, and since there's a five year horizon on it, essentially nothing will ever horizon because you will have used next year what you carried over this year and year after year that'll be true. But the other thing is, and I, and I think it was more critical, is one of, the op one of the things that we've talked about in the executive committee when we talked about carryover is we wanted to avoid being in the same position years from now with credits sure. that, that we're in today. And this was one of the ways to avoid that. If you've got to use that accumulation next year, then we don't have this banking and storing that goes on forever. But if you can store up to 100% of your allocation, and so now you've got 200% of your water, uh, and you know you're going to lose, in, in five years, you're going to start losing some of that, do you... Do you, do, are you losing your incentive to really be efficient with your water this year when you know you've got 200% of what your normal allocation is? I'd say, A, no, no, not if you can sell it. Um, and um, uh, I, I guess in, in theory the answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. I guess the other side of that coin is if your allocation is that great that you're able to save, you know, you're able, you have 200% of your allocation, you don't need it, maybe your allocation is too high, but that's... Well, That's another problem. But. Well, yeah, you, 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 all kinds of scenarios. We could have wet years. We could have, oh, yeah. you know, and, 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 and suddenly be in, in different situations. But I just wanted to revisit that uh, as we go forward. And I appreciate um, Director Craven bringing up the issue about the OH pipeline, um, which I had. And um, that is, uh, those are my questions. Thank you very much. All right. I had one question on uh, item, or this is section 1.10, and that paragraph reads, the extraction allocations established under this ordinance are consistent with the land use elements of the applicable general plans. 
to the extent that there is sufficient sustainable yield in the basins to serve the land use designations therein. To me, that reads that we think there's sufficient sustainable yield to serve all the land use designations. And I don't know if many people think that's true at all. We, we are short sufficient sustainable yield. We may be able to supplement that in future years with a project or something, but this paragraph doesn't make sense to me. Could somebody staff it? I can try to explain it. The, this is a requirement under uh, Sigma that uh, any allocation uh, uh, include a finding that uh, the, the ordinance is consistent with the applicable general plans unless there is an insufficient um, sustainable yield to, uh, to, to serve those existing land uses. So this was an attempt to say that we believe uh, that, that they are consistent, but to the extent that there will be a need uh, for reductions that will uh, put us in a situation where we are unable to provide sufficient water for those uses, that that is the reason that it's that it's the uh, the inability to attain sustainability uh, while serving or providing groundwater to those existing land uses. So that, that's the reason for the inclusion of this. I, I didn't follow that. Um, we 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 say often in in our GSPs, I believe we say that we require reductions, particularly in the Oxnard and PV basins. To achieve, to achieve sustainability, significant reductions. And so how can we say here that there's sufficient sustainable yield? Well, it, it, the, the language is, is that to the extent there is sustainable yield. So the, the intent there was that um, uh, if, if this does not provide for sufficient uh, groundwater to, to support those uses, it's because the sustainable yield will not support those uses. And, and therefore, we would be unable to achieve sustainability by continuing to allow the level of groundwater use that, that is needed to support those land uses. Uh, that, that, that was the intent, and I, I believe it. The language seems kind of cumbersome to me, but. It, it, it is, and, uh, and it, it is, uh, and, <laughs> A require, again, a requirement under Sigma that that we include that finding uh, with regard to the applicable land use plans. Steve, Jim, oh. yeah, I did have just one other follow-up question. Um, issue was raised about the fact that um, uh, Greg from uh, Duda Farms about the fact that we're going to now actually increase extractions above where we are today. How much are we going to increase extractions above where we are today? Do you, do you know what that number is going to is? If I remember correctly, this this allocation starts us off at 110,000 for Oxnard Pleasant Valley when you add all the water, Conejo Creek, Flex, and uh, uh, pumping allocations. I think we're starting off at 110, 112. Well, that's that's correct, Director Ron. You accept. Uh, I think it's incorrect to include the flex in there. That's how much there could be in any given year, but that should, again, it's a, it's a borrowing on the Santa Clara River. Um, and uh, why, don't you look that up, why don't you look that up later and just give that to me off number? Offline. Yes, we've talked about that here, but I don't recall. <clears throat> okay, thank you. That's one of Thank you. Robert, yeah, the question I have for you um, came from uh, Jurgen in regards to management areas. And we've been uh, various times thrown around this acronym called SWIM area there, particularly the seawater uh, intrusion area and possibly uh, doing a management area down there. Um, has staff had any chance to think about replacement water or whether what the language would be or is that something that will be coming back at a later time when we get into the actual uh, ramp downs if they're necessary? Uh, Director Ranio, uh as we've talked about uh, many times in terms of the GSP development, the next phase is to start looking at the basin optimization, the projects, 
and what it's going to cost and how are we going to get to sustainable yield in the 20 years. And that's what we'll start looking at that. Um, <clears throat> your board has traditionally uh, taken the position of uh, wanting to provide equity or, or to uh, find a way to make folks whole if there is a change. And I think that's been the presumption that that would continue. But um, there needs to be, that's the next phase following adoption in the, in the next coming few years to really start examining how we're going to get there and uh, um, with a large stakeholder process with your board. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The, um, where are we on the agenda? Okay, we're item three, consider adoption of the ordinance. <clears throat> With that, is there, I guess, is there a, is there a motion to adopt the ordinance? I would so move with the two changes. I think there were only two changes we made. The changes at 4.2 and 4.5, removing the words owned and. I think it was 4.2 and 5.5. Yes. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second there. You need a roll call, please. Chair West? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Aranio? Yes. Director Craven? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. Right, moving on then to item number five, resolution 2019-04, authorizing agency staff to apply DWR for a grant. Good afternoon, Chair West and Directors. For the record, my name is Kathleen Rydell, and here I, I am here to present item five, and thank you for reading the title. There is an opportunity for the agency to obtain grant funds uh, to develop the groundwater sustainability plans. It's through the Department of Water Resources Proposition 68 um, grant program for planning grants. Um, so the conditions of being uh, applying for and um, receiving the grant is that it's to be for a high and medium priority basins, that the funding is available to groundwater sustainability agencies, costs eligible for reimbursement had to be incurred after June 5th, 2018, that's when Prop 68 was adopted. Minimum local cost share is 25%. And the adoption of a resolution is required. And the application is due November 1st, 2019 at 1 o'clock. So your board has authorized the development of groundwater sustainability plans. We've been working on those groundwater sustainability plans. Significant work has been performed since June 5th, 2018. Um, so a draft resolution was uh, prepared for your consideration. So included in the agenda packet is item 5A. And in inclusion, the round three planning grant provides the opportunity for reimbursement of some of the GSP development costs that have been incurred. And adoption of a resolution by the applicant is required. Therefore, it's staff's recommendation to adopt resolution 2019-04, authorizing agency staff to apply for California Department of Water Resources, um, to water, Cal CD, California Department of Water Resources to obtain a grant under the 2019 Sustainable Groundwater Management Grant Program Planning Grant Round 3. Thank you, Kathleen. Any questions or comments from the board? You know, anytime somebody wants to give us money, we should put it on the consent agenda. But that's, uh, <laughs> any questions or comments from the public? Move approval. Well, one second. There's some questions or comments. Come on. I didn't have any questions or comments, but Oxnard's uh, planning on writing a support letter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call. 
Chair West? Yes. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Aranio? Yes. Director Craven? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. Thank you. Is there a motion to receive and file the executive officers? So moved. A second? All in favor? Okay, we will, we will uh, what? temporarily, I guess, recess this meeting to go into closed session to return hopefully soon. Thank you. Um, closed session to report that no action was taken. It would be reported out. We're adjourned. Thank you.